Greetings to each of you from the Democratic Republic of Congo. This photograph of the Kinshasa Temple construction site was taken last Saturday, October 29th. If you look carefully, you can see the rebar marking the walls where the Masons began their work this week. Thousands of primary children from throughout this city of over 12 million people have written their names on painted rocks gathered from the stony banks of the Congo River. Sister Chris Gates, a temple construction missionary who, with her husband, organized the project, had asked the Area 70s to carry bags of rocks to thousands of additional Congolese primary children in regions outside the capital city. But plans had to be changed when the risk of their arrest under suspicion of smuggling rare minerals was realized. These were indeed rare stones, but not of the ordinary kind. These are some of the primary children in our ward, holding up pictures of the temple with the primary presidency and Bishop M. A. Ngoy seated on the back row. The rocks are being incorporated into the temple structure itself. As the cement is poured, the rocks are poured in with it. Each time the children visit the temple, they will remember that they are literally part of the temple walls, just as the temple will gradually become part of them. Imagine what a blessing the temple will be to faithful families such as this one who, on an income of just a few dollars a day, could never afford the thousands of dollars needed to fly to South Africa to be sealed. The presentation that Matt Bowen and I have prepared for today is centered on the ordinances of spiritual rebirth that draw on the companionship of the Holy Ghost and the power of the Atonement of Jesus Christ in order to sanctify and unite such families forever. One of the most poignant and instructive stories of the Gospel of John tells of Nicodemus' private visit to inquire of Jesus. Like the humble Peter whose foibles and weaknesses are candidly presented in the Gospels, it seems that Nicodemus was not reluctant to share the story of his transformation from wander wandering skeptic to devoted disciple. Indeed, it is plausible that he was John's eyewitness source for the account that we will now discuss in more detail. As the basis for Nicodemus' belief that Jesus was a teacher come from God, he explained. No one is able to do the miraculous signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus discounted Nicodemus' declaration with a parallel assertion. No one is able to see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. The master was saying that Nicodemus was mistaken in taking the miracles as the basis for his confidence in Jesus as a divine teacher. Though Nicodemus had seen these signs, he did not see the kingdom of God. To see the kingdom of God, and eventually to enter within it, said Jesus, one must be born again. Indeed, seeing the kingdom of God is a prerequisite for entering into it. Joseph Smith taught that even to see the kingdom of God, individuals must have a change of heart that would take the veil from before their eyes. That said, Nicodemus' astonishment at Jesus' teaching was not an entirely negative thing. Since in later rabbinic literature, marveling or wondering formed an important part of the process of gaining knowledge. For example, it was said of Rabbi Akiba that his learning began with wonder and culminated with a crown, a symbol of his power to bring hidden things to light. Thus Jesus' words to Nicodemus that night, marvel not, should not be understood as a peremptory dismissal of interlocutor's initial doubts, but rather as a spur to his further faith and inquiry. Up to that moment, however, Nicodemus had had no such change of heart. His eyes were still veiled. As a test of Nicodemus' powers of spiritual perception, the Lord had used a double entente, or double meaning, in his discussion on the subject of being born again. The Greek expression could mean both born again, a second time, and also born from above. Each time Jesus repeated the requirement for those who would see and enter the kingdom of God to be born from above, in other words, born of the Spirit, Nicodemus heard only the most obvious superficial meaning of Jesus saying, namely that one must be born again, or in other words, born of the flesh, mistakenly thinking that Jesus referred to one's coming forth a second time from the mother's womb. At that point, Jesus fully explained what it meant not only to be born of the water and of the Spirit, but also to be fully born of God. Once again, the Lord's elaboration simultaneously disclosed and obscured his meaning through the use of double entendre, quote, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. To comprehend the double meaning of lifted up in Jesus' words, we must first realize that in the story of Moses, 
both the serpents that bit the Israelites and the figure on the standard that was lifted up by Moses were not meant to be seen as ordinary desert snakes. Rather, in the rich symbolism of the Old Testament, they are portrayed as representations of the glorious seraphim, using the same Hebrew terms that are used elsewhere in Scripture to describe the angelic attendants of God's throne. If we fail to identify the seraphim of the heavenly temple with the fiery flying serpents that were presented as both the plague and the salvation of the children of Israel, we lack the interpretive key for the entire chapter. Once we realize that these, in these verses, Jesus has compared himself as the Son of Man, or more explicitly as the Son of the Man of Holiness, meaning the Son of God, to the seraphim that surround in intimate proximity the throne of the Father. The meaning of his statement that he was to be lifted up becomes apparent. In temple context, the essential function of the seraphim was analogous to the role of the cherubim at the entrance of the Garden of Eden. They were to be as sentinels or keepers of the way, guarding the portals of the heavenly temple against unauthorized entry governing subsequent access to increasingly secure compartments, and ultimately assisting in the determination of the fitness of worshippers to enter God's presence. Thus Jesus, described by Nephi as the keeper of the gate, could legitimately and literally assert, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus' application of the phrase lifted up to himself is appropriate for additional reasons. For example, the imagery ties back to Isaiah 52, 13, a verse in the Messianic Servant Song, quote, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high, end of quote. Isaiah's language describes the suffering and exaltation of Jesus Christ. Significantly, however, in the Book of Mormon, the resurrected Jesus Christ himself demonstrates that this prophecy can also be applied to the prophet of the Restoration. Thus it becomes clear that others, in addition to Jesus Christ, can be lifted up, becoming sons of man, through continued faithfulness in the face of suffering. This is consistent with the explicit teaching in the first chapter of the Gospel of John that, quote, as many as received Christ, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, end of quote. Note that the Greek phrase, sons of God, in this and in other scriptural references and equivalent context that we will cite below, is gender neutral. In short, whereas readers sometimes equate the lifting up of Christ exclusively with his death on the cross, more careful examination of the passage makes it clear that John is exploiting a double meaning in the term lifted up. Should there be any doubt of the subtle, almost implicit literary art pre present in John's account, consider the explicit confirmation of similar, deliberate wordplay found in 3 Nephi 27. In only two verses, Jesus shifts artfully and seemingly seemingly effortlessly among multiple senses of lifted up, including lifted up on the cross, lifted up by men in unrighteous judgment, lifted up by the Father in righteous judgment, and significantly lifted up at the last day in exaltation. Returning to the context of John 3, it is clear that the lifting up of Jesus has as much to do with his heavenly ascent and glorious enthronement as it does with his ignominious death. Hence, according to Herman Ritterbos, Quote, the crucifixion is not presented by John as Jesus' humiliation, but as the exaltation of the Son of Man, a birth from above that he intended to share with his disciples. End of quote. Thus those who look and begin to believe in the Son of God as he is typologically revealed in the seraphic figure that has been lifted up will themselves receive eternal life, being lifted up, meaning exalted, with their Lord. Consistent with Jesus' expectation that Nicodemus, as a master of Israel, should have already been familiar with this line of interpretation, there is evidence that some early Jewish exegetes in the more mystic tradition may have also understood seeing God's kingdom in terms of visionary ascents to heaven, witnessing the enthroned king. Moreover, the Jewish scholar Philo, a near contemporary of Jesus Christ, declares that the Sinai revelation worked in Moses a second birth, which transformed him from an earthly to a heavenly man. Jesus, by way of contrast, came from above to begin with and grants others a birth from above. Several scholars have argued that the ideas corresponding to those of Philo about the culminating steps of a second birth from above may have been reflected figuratively in Jewish ritual at Qumran and elsewhere. These rituals enacted the liturgical equivalent of actual heavenly ascent.
As has been detailed elsewhere, these rituals seem to have been, at least in the case of the synagogue of Dura Europos, centered on the story of Ezekiel's vision in chapter 37 of the resurrection of the dry bones. Ezekiel 36 and 37, like John 3, speak of the cleansing and transforming power of water and spirit and promise exaltation and eternal life to the faithful through a new and everlasting covenant. In terminology reminiscent of royal investiture and exaltation, with conceptual roots in the first temple that will recall for Latter-day Saints the symbolism of modern temples, the Lord says in Ezekiel 16, Then washed I thee with water, yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee with broidered work, and shod thee with badger skin, and girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk, and I put a beautiful crown upon thine head. End of quote. In reflecting on Jesus' words, Nicodemus might have begun to remember these and other prophetic passages that describe what is meant by being born of God ritually in anticipation of the eventual literal fulfillment of God's promise to Moses that Israel as a body eventually was to become a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. By way of summary, a careful reading of John 3 based on modern linguistic evidence and adequate consideration of relevant threads in Jewish scripture and tradition makes it clear that being born again, perhaps better expressed as being born from above or born of God, is not a process that is completed when one is baptized by water and receives the Holy Ghost. Disciples of Jesus Christ are not fully reborn ritually until they have received and kept all the ordinances and covenants of the temple to the end, and are not fully reborn in actuality until they attain the knowledge of the, God, of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ both suffering in his likeness and also being lifted up to eternal life and exaltation as he was. Continuing the theme of spiritual rebirth in the remainder of our presentation, we'll examine issues and insights related to the three key phrases of Moses 660, one by one. By the water ye keep the commandment, by the spirit ye are justified, and by the blood ye are sanctified. By the water ye keep the commandment. Now, now let us survey six topics that provide some of the idea of the richness of ancient traditions and modern revelation relating to the ordinances of baptism and washing with water. Baptism as a commandment and as an introduction to the law of obedience. Several scripture references characterize baptism by water as a commandment, both as a means to demonstrate obedience to the divine directive to be baptized, and also as a sign of willingness to keep the law of obedience with respect to all God's other commandments. For example, Nephi cites the Savior as a witness to his father that he would be obedient unto him in keeping the commandments. Notably, the blessing on the sacrament bread, an ordinance that is intimately linked with baptism, also mentions that the eating of the bread is a witness that those who partake, quote, are willing to keep his commandments, end of quote. The specific connection between the sacramental bread and baptism is reinforced by the pointed omission of a reference to being willing to take his name upon them and keeping the commandments in the companion blessing on the emblems representing the blood of Christ. More will be said later about the distinctive symbolism of the two parts of the sacrament. Baptism as, a gate, as the gate to the pathway that leads to eternal life. Latter-day Saints know that repentance and baptism are symbolized in Scripture as a gate, the essential entry point to the straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life. Associating the gate of baptism with all subsequent laws and ordinances of the priesthood, Joseph Smith made it clear that baptism was not only a commandment, but also a sign. Quote, Baptism is a sign ordained of God for the believer in Christ to take upon himself in order to enter into the kingdom of God. It is a sign of command which God has set for man to enter. There are certain key words and signs belonging to the priesthood which must be observed in order to obtain the blessing. Had Cornelius not taken these signs or ordinances upon him, he could not have healed the sick or commanded an evil spirit to come out of a man and it obey him. For the spirits might say unto him as they did to the sons of Siva, Paul we know and Jesus we know, but who are ye? The Antiquity of Water Symbolism in Washing Rituals of Rebirth Some scholars, including among others David J. Larson and Stephen D. Ricks, have argued that the water symbolism of baptism is connected to rituals in ancient Israel wherein the king was washed and anointed 
both prior to his initiation and also at regular renewals of his right to rule. Relevant symbolism can also be found in the early religious literature of the ancient Mesopotamia. For example, in the story of Atrahasis, we can trace the basic conception that water, spirit, and blood, the latter derived from the body of a slain deity, were the life-giving elements used by the gods in the creation of humankind. In addition, we know that the use of water was as essential to the rites of kingship in Old Babylon as it was in the Old Testament. David Calabro has explored the possibility that a text similar to the Book of Moses may have been used in Solomon's temple to instruct and guide initiates through different parts of the Israelite temple to specific areas where instruction was given and rituals were performed, including an association that might be made between the text of Moses 6 describing Adam's baptism and the molten sea that stood in front of the temple. It is evident that the two sorts of washings, namely baptism and priestly or kingly initiation in the temple, became confused in the first centuries after Christ, making it difficult to be sure what kind of ordinance is taking place when scripture and tradition mention the use of water in religious ritual. For example, in some baptismal rites, the candidate was stripped of his garments of the garments inherited from Adam and vested with the tokens of these garments he or she shall enjoy at the resurrection. In other early Christian baptismal traditions, the idea of reversing the blows of death was represented by a special anointing with the oil of mercy prior to or sometimes after baptism or washing, as a candidate is signed upon the brow, the nostrils, the breast, the ears, and so forth. Circumcision, Covenant, and Baptism in Antiquity, and the Joseph Smith Translation of the Bible. Circumcision, Covenant, and Baptism are tightly linked both in Antiquity and in Joseph Smith's translations. For example, a pointed reference in connecting the themes of circumcision and baptism can be found in a reference to the blood of Abel that within, within Joseph Smith's translation of the book of Genesis. The story of Abel has always been linked with the idea of proper sacrifice, Indeed, his name seems to be a deliberate part on the richness, pun, on the richness of the sacrifice that he will make in contrast to the stingy offering of Cain. Joseph, the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible goes further in connecting the death of the righteous Abel to an anomalous ordinance of sprinkling of blood coupled with washing or baptism for little children that is denounced in Genesis 17, 3 through 7. And God talked to Abram, saying, my people have gone astray from my precepts, and have not kept mine ordinances which I gave unto their fathers. And they have not observed mine anointing, and the burial or baptism wherewith I commanded them, but have turned from the commandment, and have taken to themselves the washing of children, and the blood of sprinkling, and have said that the blood of the righteous Abel was shed for sins, and have not known wherein they are accountable before me. To counteract this practice, we are told that the Lord established the covenant of circumcision at the age of eight days, that thou mayest know forever that thy children are not accountable before me until they are eight years old. A late related reference to Hebrews 12.24, which speaks of the saints coming to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. With regard to that, this scripture, Keg Kuster cites the possibility that the author of Hebrews may be suggesting that, quote, Abel's blood brought a limited atonement, while Jesus' blood brought complete atonement, end of quote. Paralleling the false notion in the Joseph, described in the Joseph Smith translation that, quote, the blood of the righteous Abel was shed for sins, end of quote, Serge Ruser interprets early Christian and Islamic accounts as depicting a group that looked to Abel rather than Christ for salvation. Additional evidence suggesting a belief in salvific power for Abel's blood comes from a first Enoch description of Abel as a red calf. Patrick Tiller sees this as an allusion to the red heifer of Numbers 19. The red heifer was a pointedly young animal used in purification rites comprising a washing and a sprinkling of blood for those who had come into contact with, quote, one found slain and lying in the field, end of quote, as was Abel. A widely varying set of Islamic accounts attempt to explain the origin of a related Quranic story. What these accounts have in common is the idea that the murderer denied his crime but was identified by the voice of the dead man who was touched by the sacrificial animal. Could this be an echo of the voice of the righteous Abel, of whom it is said in Scripture that, quote, His blood cries unto God from the ground, he being dead, yet speaketh. In summary, 
There is ample evidence from a variety of sources to support the plausibility of the account in the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, wherein anomalous rituals for little children purporting to cleanse them by washing them with sprinkling of blood are coupled with the erroneous idea that the blood of the righteous Abel was shed for sins. As a figure associated anciently with proper sacrifice, with baptism, and with innocent martyrdom, Abel arguably would have attracted mistaken religious notions of this character. Significantly, the rationales for the institution of circumcision in the Joseph Smith translation of the Old Testament are consistent with Samuel Zinner's conclusion about the symbolic connection between circumcision and baptism in its New Testament context, namely that baptism was not meant to replace circumcision, but rather that it complements and perfects it. Digression. Baptism and washing is illustrations of the nature of all ordinances. Before concluding our discussion on the symbolism of water and salvation, we digress to show how baptism and washings provide a paradigmatic illustration of the nature of all priesthood ordinances. We conclude our brief study of baptism and washings. We conclude from our brief study of baptism and washings that they, like other priesthood ordinances, are symbolic, salvific, interrelated, and additive, retrospective, and anticipatory. Symbolic. Hugh Nibley described the endowment as a model, a presentation of figurative terms. The same can be said for baptism, which Paul described as a symbol of death and resurrection. Salvific. While recognizing the superior forms of pedagogy embodied in the symbolism of the ordinances, Elder David A. Bednar taught that we err if we think that their value is limited to inspired instruction. He said, citing DNC 84, 19-21, the ordinances of salvation and exaltation administered in the Lord's restored church are far more than rituals or symbolic performances. Rather, they constitute authorized channels through which the blessings and powers of heaven can flow into individual lives." End of quote. Interrelated and Additive Elder David A. Bednar has also taught, quote, The ordinances of baptism by immersion, the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, and the sacrament are not isolated and discrete events. Rather, they are elements in an interrelated and additive pattern of redemptive progress." End of quote. Retrospective. An appreciation of the retrospective regard of the ordinances clears up any confusion about the relationship between baptism and other washing ordinances. Since the time of Adam, baptism has been the first introductory saving ordinance of the gospel given in mortal life and any similar rites, similarities of baptism to later ordinances are meant to highlight and build upon that resemblance retrospectively. Going further, the ordinance received by Aaron when he was washed, anointed, and clothed in holy garments so that he might minister unto the Lord in the priest's office retrospectively recapitulates his foreordination of the premortal world to this, pre to this priesthood calling. President Spencer W. Kimball taught that in pre-mortal life, faithful women were also given assignments to be carried out later on earth. Speaking of Christ as the prototype for all those who are foreordained to priestly offices, the Gospel of Philip makes it clear that the meaning, symbolism, and sequence of the ordinances has always been the same. Quote, he who was begotten before everything was begotten anew, in other words, by the water. He who was once anointed was anointed anew in other words, by the Spirit. He who was redeemed in turn, redeemed others, in other words, by the blood. Anticipatory. Because the round of eternity is embedded in the ordinances, we would expect that them not only to be retrospective, but also anticipatory in nature. For example, in Moses 5, Adam learns that the ordinance of animal sacrifice was instituted in explicit anticipation of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father, just as, of course, the ordinance of the sacrament looks back retrospectively on that same expiatory sacrifice. Note also that the symbol of death and resurrection in the ordinance and covenant of baptism anticipates the instruction, the instruction and covenants of temple endowment that further detail the responsibilities and blessings of those who will rise in the first resurrection. Similarly, the initiatory ordinances of washing, anointing, and clothing provide an anticipatory capsule summary of all the ordinances. Indeed, one might say that in every detail, the performance of the initiatory ordinance reflects the threefold symbolism of water, spirit, and blood found in Moses 6, thus outlining the path of exaltation that is further elaborated in the endowment. 
The anticipatory nature of the initiatory ordinance is captured in Truman G. Madsen's description of it as, quote, a patriarchal blessing to every organ and attribute and power of our being, a blessing that is to be fulfilled in this world and the next. Going further, Elder John A. Witso taught that earthly ordinances prefigure heavenly ordinances. Great eternal truths make up the gospel plan. All regulations for man's earthly guidance have their eternal spiritual counterparts. The earthly ordinances of the gospel are themselves only reflections of heavenly ordinances. There is no water baptism in the next estate, nor any conferring of the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of earthly hands. The equivalents of these ordinances prevail, no doubt, in every estate, but only as they are given on earth can they be made to aid in their onward progress those who have dwelt on the earth." End of quote. Now we turn our attention, all too briefly, to the phrase, by the Spirit ye are justified. What does it mean to be justified? Simply put, individuals become just, in other words, innocent before God and ready for a covenant relationship with Him, when they demonstrate sufficient rep repentance to qualify for an initial cleansing from sin by the Spirit, thus having had the demands of justice satisfied on their behalf through the Savior's atoning blood. But don't the scriptures refer specifically to baptism for the remission of sins? Although baptism by proper authority is absolutely necessary, it is but the outward sign of faith in Jesus Christ. A significant phrase in D&C 2037 explains with precision that it is not the performance of the baptismal ordinance itself that cleanses, but rather the individuals having, quote, truly manifested by their works that they have received of the Spirit of Christ unto remission of their sins, end of quote, a requirement that is meant to precede water baptism. How do the ongoing processes of justification and sanctification complement and sustain one another? To adapt imagery from C.S. Lewis, it might be said that the interwoven processes of justification and sanctification are as complementary and net mutually necessary as the two blades of a pair of scissors. Without justification, the companionship and power of the Holy Ghost are not operative, because the Spirit of the Lord doth not dwell in unholy temples. For those who are clean, the companionship and power of the Holy Ghost are both available and necessary for the ongoing work of sanctification, whereby individuals are, quote, enabled to keep the commandments of God and grow in holiness, end of quote. When those on the path of sanctification fail to keep the commandments, they must be justified again before they can continue onward. In this way, the complementary processes of justification, remission of sins, and sanctification, the gradual changing of one's nature that allows individuals to become new creatures in Christ, operate throughout our lives, preparing us eventually to be born again in the ultimate sense. Aided by a repeated preparation for and participation in the ordinance of the sacrament, we can always retain a justificatory remission of our sins, and we can always have the Spirit of the Lord to be with us for the ongoing work of sanctification. This figure superposes the sequence of justif justification, sanctification, and exaltation upon the layout of ordinance rooms on the second floor of the Salt Lake Temple. It is meant to illustrate how justification and sanctification can be seen from a different but equally valid perspective as sequential steps instead of as parts of an interwoven process. These steps are described in King Benjamin's imagery as first, putting off the natural man, without which one cannot be clothed upon with robes of righteousness, and then second, becoming a saint. These transformations are both made possible through the atonement of Christ the Lord. From this perspective, we might consider the initial remission of sins through the Spirit, the washing ordinance of baptism, and the receiving of the gift of the Holy Ghost after confirmation, as accomplishing the first step of justification. Though their continued faith in Jesus Christ, through their continued faith in Jesus Christ and faithfulness and keeping the commandments, individuals living in a telestial world may progress to a point where they can begin to be quickened by a portion of the terrestrial glory. In the process of sanctification, associated with terrestrial glory, individuals come to receive of the same unto a fullness through additional ordinances and the ongoing sanctifying anointing, as it were, of the Spirit of the Lord. Finally, having received a fullness of the terrestrial glory, having experienced a perfect brightness of hope, demonstrating their capacity for supreme self-sacrifice as required by the law of consecration, and being filled with charity, the pure love of Christ, 
These individuals can be sealed up unto eternal life by revelation of the spirit of prophecy through the power of the holy priesthood. In this manner they are sanctified, so that they might be quickened by a portion of the celestial glory and behold the face of God. In the process of exaltation, individuals have been previously cleansed by blood, even the blood of the only begotten that they might be sanctified from all sin, may then go on to receive additional blessings in the celestial world, being crowned with honor and glory and immortality and eternal lives. The Lord has said of these individuals that they shall be clothed upon, even as I am, to become one with me, that we may be one. Jew justification and sanctification come by the Spirit or through the Savior. Because justification and sanctification are accomplished through the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost and at the same time are made possible through the atonement of Christ, it is no contradiction when Scripture testifies both that we are sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost and also that it is by the blood that we are sanctified. D&C 20, 30-31 tells us that both justification and sanctification come through the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The form of baptism, being performed in the likeness of death and resurrection, and the form of the physical action of the laying on of hands that is used in confirmation, both suggest a retrospective regard toward the scriptural account of the creation of Adam, wherein God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. As Joseph Smith highlighted the importance of the manner in which baptism is performed, describing it as a sign, so he also specified specifically referred to the means by which the Holy Ghost is given and the sick are healed through the laying on of hands as a sign. He said pointedly, pointedly that if it were performed in any other way, it would fail. Both biblical and Egyptian sources associate the receiving of divine breath not merely with an infusion of life, but also with royal status. For example, Isaiah attributes the presence of the Lord, Spirit of the Lord to a prior messianic anointing. The Spirit of the Lord is a God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me. End of quote. Anointing followed by an outpouring of the Spirit is documented as part of the rites of kingship in ancient Israel, such as when Samuel anointed David, quote, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. End of quote. Even in modern times, one sees vestiges of the symbolism of anointing, royal status, and the Holy Spirit brought together. For example, prior to the British ceremonies of coronation, in the holiest rite of that service, the monarch is divested of robes, clothed in simple white linen, and screened from the general view in order to be imbued with grace through the archbishop's anointing with holy oil on hand, breast, and forehead. Just as the separate yet interrelated rites of baptism and other washings with water became blurred in early Christianity, so also the distinctive ordinances of confirmation and anointing were confused. However, from modern revelation we know that confirmation for the gift of the Holy Ghost is the first ordinance administered by the Melchizedek priesthood. In interrelated, additive fashion, temple initiatory ordinances of washing and anointing echo and build upon the ordinances of baptism and confirmation, while also looking forward to in anticipation to subsequent confirmatory announcings, anointings wherein we imitate the Christ. Indeed, the title Christ is explained in Pseudo-Clement's recognitions as an anointing of oil, quote, Him first God anointed. From that anointing, therefore, he is called Christ, end of quote. Confirming that this was an ordinance not meant to be strict, restricted to the Lord himself, Tertullian describes, quote, a practice derived from the old discipline, wherein, on entering the priesthood, Men were wont to be anointed with oil from the, a horn ever since Aaron was anointed by Moses. Whence Aaron is called Christ from the chrism, which is the unction or oil of anointing. C.S. Lewis expressed the principle behind this practice succinctly quote, Every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. Of course, becoming a little Christ is not a process that ends with an anticipatory anointing. There is a double meaning in the phrase, by the blood ye are sanctified, as was expressed in the previously cited words about Christ from the Gospel of Philip. He who was redeemed, in turn, redeemed others. Although redemption itself comes only in and through the atonement of the only begotten Son, it might be said similarly with regard to those who, in the words of Alma 13, have been ordained after the order of the Son, quote, he who was redeemed with a preparatory redemption 
in turn must assist with all his heart, might, mind, and strength to bring about the redemption of others. In other words, those who would follow Christ to the end must continue to move beyond the keeping of the law of obedience and sacrifice toward the complete dedication required by the law of consecration. Before saying more on this point, let us first examine the essential role and symbolism of blood in the context of the ordinances, for by the blood ye are sanctified. Because blood was a symbol of life, it was reserved for use on the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Exodus 24.8 recounts how blood was sprinkled upon all the people in order to ratify the covenant, making it binding on Israel. At the same time, the sprinkling of blood symbolized the sanctification of Moses and his fellows, who immediately thereafter were enabled to see Jehovah. Following a similar description of the appearance of the Lord in the Kirtland Temple, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were told, quote, Your sins are forgiven you. In other words, they were justified. You are clean before me. In other words, they were sanctified. Properly, of course, the sinner's own blood must be used in sacrificial ordinances, explained Hugh Nibley, unless a goel, a representative substitute, advocate, or redeemer, could be found to take one's place. The willingness of the candidate to sacrifice his own life, the adhika, is symbolized by the blood on the right thumb and the right earlobe, where the blood would be if the throat had been cut, end of quote. In the case of Isaac's near sacrifice of Abraham, at the last moment a sacrificial ram was supplied in his stead. More important, however, as Hugh Nibley relates, is the fact that, quote, Isaac himself was a substitute. In Jewish tradition, writes Rosenberg, Isaac is the prototype of the suffering servant, bound upon the altar as a sacrifice. Rosenberg has shown that the title of suffering servant was used in the ancient Near East to designate the substitute king, the noble victim. Accordingly, the new Isaac must be a substitute king who dies that the people must, might live. The starting point is Isaiah 52 and 53, which seem to constitute a portion of, the, of a ritual drama conferring a similar humiliation culminating in death of a substitute for the figure of a king of the Jews. End of quote. The right of sacrifice of the substitute king is found all over it, the ancient world. We have already observed that the servant song of Isaiah 52 can be generalized. In other words, it is not only to be applied to Jesus Christ, but also to others who sooner or later may qualify to become sons of man or sons of God with a small s. While the initial blessing of justification comes exclusively by means of a substitutionary sacrifice, thus relying wholly, wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save, the culminating step of the process of sanctification is a joint effort that, in addition to rely on, relying on the merits of Christ, demands that individuals themselves meet the stringent measure of self-sacrifice enjoined by the law of consecration. Quote, For we know that it is by grace that we are saved, after all we can do. Speaking of the change that, of the law that was emphasized by Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, John W. Welch explained, Quote, The old law of sacrifice was explicitly replaced by that of a broken heart and contrite spirit, and whereas previously the sacrificial animal was to be pure and without blemish, haplos, now the disciples themselves are to become single, aplos, to the glory of God, end of quote. Going further, Elder Neal A. Maxwell clarified that, quote, real personal sacrifice never was placing an animal on the altar. Instead, it is a willingness to put the animal in us upon the altar and letting it be consumed, end of quote. We return to the statement of the prophet Joseph Smith that being born again comes by the Spirit of God through ordinances, through the ordinances, we are repeatedly reborn as we experience the cleansing justification of the Spirit of Christ, the symbolism of death and resurrection through baptism of water, the new life granted us when we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the spiritual and physical renewal of the initiatory ordinances, and the unfolding stages of the drama of our existence in the endowment. Indeed, the endowment itself enacts our individual progress through multiple rebirths, from the spirit world to the mortal life and from thence to becoming sons and daughters of Christ, and ultimately of the Father himself, receiving all the blessings of the firstborn. Similarly, by the end of Moses 6, it is clear that Ad, not, not, only Adam, not only that Adam had been born of water and of the Spirit, but also that he had been born of God, as was Alma. Quote, For because of the word which has, he has imparted unto me, behold, many have been born of God, and have tasted as I have tasted, 
and have seen eye to eye as I have seen. Therefore they do know of these things of which I have spoken, as I do know, and the knowledge which I have is of God. For each change of state that accompanies one's progression through the ordinances, the Father grants a corresponding change in name and relationship to him. To paraphrase C.S. Lewis, quote, God turns tools into servants, servants into friends, and friends into sons. Moses 6, 67 and 68 makes it clear that to receive the fullness of the priesthood is, when also accompanied by divine personal ratification, to become a son of God after the order of him who is without beginning of days or end of years. Reflecting the experience of Adam in Moses 6, this idea recalls the royal rebirth formula of Psalm 2-7, quote, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, end of quote. In Mosiah 5.7, King Benjamin uses a temple setting in context to explain this same concept, quote, And now because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore ye are born of him, and have become his sons and daughters, end of quote. Significantly, King Benjamin not only goes on to say that those who keep the covenant will be found on the right hand of God, thus in essence receiving the name of their king, Benjamin, meaning son of the right hand, but also that they were taking upon them as royal sons and daughters a title of the true son of the right hand, namely Christ. In so doing, they were also to become, in likeness of the son of Benjamin, little Mosiahs, meaning saviors, and in likeness of the only begotten son of God, little Messiahs, meaning anointed ones. Having thus qualified, the Father might appropriately seal them his. Margaret Barker describes how the concept of becoming a son of God can well relate both to ordinances in the earthly temple and to actual ascents to the heavenly temple. Quote, the high priests and kings of ancient Jerusalem entered the Holy of Holies and then emerged as messengers, angels of the Lord. They had been raised up, that is, resurrected. They were sons of God, that is, angels and they were anointed ones, that is, messiahs. Human beings could become angels and then continue to live in the material world. This transformation did not just happen after physical death. It marked the passage from the life in the material world to the life of eternity." End of quote. Speaking of the figurative heavenly journey that was enacted in ancient temple ordinances, Matthew Bowen has argued elsewhere that both the king and the high priest emerging from the Holy of Holies were seen and worshipped as Yahweh the Lord. Consistent with this identification, Alma 13 states that high priests were ordained, quote, in a manner that thereby the people might know in what manner to look forward to God's Son for redemption, end of quote, and that the ancient ordinances of the high priesthood associated with the temple specifically were given, quote, that thereby the people might look forward on the Son of God for a remission of their sins, end of quote. Significantly, the last verse of Moses 6 includes the words, and thus may all become my sons. This statement relating to Adam's exaltation presages the account in Moses 7 of Enoch's adoption as a son of God with a right to God's throne. At the end of verse 3 we read, quote, And as I stood upon the mount, I beheld the heavens open, and I was clothed upon with glory. End of quote. The pseudepigraphal books of 2nd and 3rd Enoch also purport to describe the process by which Enoch was literally clothed upon with glory in some detail. As a prelude to Enoch's introduction to the secrets of creation, both accounts describe a two-step initiatory procedure whereby the patriarch was first initiated by angels and after this by the Lord himself. In second Enoch, God commanded the angels to extract Enoch from his earthly clothing and anoint him with my delightful oil and put him into the clothes of my glory. Philip Alexander speaks of this event as a quote, an ontological transformation that blurred the distinction between the human and divine amounting to deification. In the first chapter of the book of Moses, Moses underwent a similar transformation. He explained that if he had seen God without such a change, he would have withered and died in his presence. But his glory was upon me, and that I was transfigured before him. End of quote. After Enoch was changed, he is said to have resembled God so exactly that he was mistaken for him. Summarizing the ancient Jewish literature relevant to this passage, Charles Mopsick concludes that the exaltation of Enoch is not meant to be seen as a unique event, Rather, he writes that the enthronement of Enoch is a pre prelude to the transfiguration of all the righteous, and at their head the Messiah, in the world to come, a transfiguration that is the restoration of the figure of the perfect man. End of quote. 
In LDS theology, such a transformation is not the result of an arbitrary, capricious act of God, but rather a sign of love and trust made in response to individuals' demonstration of their determination to serve God at all hazard. Only such will be privileged to hear the personal oath from the Father himself that they shall obtain the fullness of the joys of the celestial kingdom forever and ever. Hugh Nibley sums up the principle of sanctification by the blood as follows. The gospel, quote, the gospel is more than a catalog of moral platitudes. These are matters of etern either eternal life or nothing. Nothing less than the sacrifice of Abraham is demanded of us. But how do we make it? In the way that Abraham, Isaac, and Sarah all did. Each was willing and expected to be sacrificed, and each committed his, his or her all to prove it. In each case, the sacrifice was interrupted at the last moment, and a substitute provided to their relief. Someone else had to be willing to pay the price, but not until after they had shown their good faith and willingness to go all the way. Quote, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, for now I know. End of quote. Abraham had gone far enough. He had proven to himself and the angels who stood witness, we are told, that he was actually willing to perform the act. Therefore the Lord was satisfied with the token then, for he knew the heart of Abraham. This is the same for Isaac and Sarah and for us. And who, whoever is willing to make the sacrifice of Abraham to receive eternal life will show up by the same signs and tokens as Abraham. But he or she must do it in good faith and with real intent. End of quote. Understanding the self-sacrifice required in order to become a saint enhances the meaning one can take away when participating in the ordinances of the sacrament. Although, as we have argued earlier, the eating of the broken bread is tightly linked in its symbolism to the initial covenant of baptism through the common witness of an intention to keep God's commandments, we are persuaded that the drinking in the second part of the sacrament can be seen profitably as an epitome of the covenants and ordinances that follow baptism. In particular, we might see it as an expression of the last and most difficult covenant of consecration, symbolizing the blood by which we are sanctified. As Ugo E. Perego succinctly expressed it, through the partaking of the consecrated bread and wine, we also consecrate ourselves, end of quote. This understanding of the covenant we are making is consistent with the recent teaching emphasis of church leaders that, quote, the sacrament is a beautiful time not just to renew our baptismal covenants, but to commit to him to renew all our covenants. In the second part of the sacrament, the saints not only witness that they are willing to take the Savior's name upon them in the essential but strictly limited sense of accepting the blessings of justification made possible by his submitting his will to the will of the Father, even unto death, but also by their personal willingness to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon them, even as a child does submit to his Father, even unto death thus qualifying themselves to the blessings of sanctification in the spirit of the law of consecration. In the carefully measured, specifically tailored manner that God has ordained for those who would follow Jesus to the end, disciples of Christ must be willing to suffer themselves, sometimes unjustly and always uncomplainingly, that they, in likeness of Christ, might bring others to God. In the sacramental symbolism of drinking the emblems of sanctifying blood, they must not only express their gratitude for the bitter cup that the Savior drank on their behalf, but also must acknowledge that they are willing to drink the individually prepared cup that they have themselves been given to the dregs. Moreover, in doing this, they must covenant not only to give away all their sins to know God, but also undertake a deliberate and sustained effort to know Him through giving their all. All, all this so that when the Lord comes again in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, that they may be among the sanctified who will drink of the fruit of the vine, the emblems of his blood, with him and with all his saints on the sanctified earth. Thank you.